Okay, right. All right, good morning. Thanks for coming out. Um, I'm going to be talking about raised bed gardening. And uh, just to let you know, in case you haven't picked up the bit of accent, eh? I'm not from around these parts. <laughs> okay. I'm actually from Western Canada, Vancouver Island in, in Canada. I've only lived here now for 22 months. And I come here via seven years of living in Moscow, Russia in an apartment, which is probably the only time in my life I didn't garden. Because I grew up as the um, oldest of four in a single parent family and had to help mom out in the garden. And I remember those gar that gardening day as being a whole lot of weeding. And one of the things I love about raised bed gardening is I hardly weed at all. Weeding's gone, or virtually gone. It becomes incredibly manageable. I spend maybe 30 minutes a week weeding, right? And I've got, in terms of my vegetable garden, I've got a little over, what did I figure out? About 250 square feet of raised bed vegetable garden and then a bunch of flower beds also. So <clears throat> that's why I like it. So, and just to really quickly emphasize here, a lot of raised bed gardens around here in particular, building people like mine are being built out of wood. Right? But you can build a raised bed garden by using concrete blocks, stone, brick. Your simplest raised bed gardening is just to scoop up the earth or pour a bunch of good soil or compost, which is what I would really recommend, on top of the dirt and, and build in there. Right? Is, your, so. is your sound system working? Be your pardon? No, this microphone is just for the TV, but if, if I need to speak louder, just let me know, okay? Because I can project. I can really project. <laughs> All right, so let's see if this is working. There we go. So I like them because I'm a little bit lazy if I can get away with it, right? Why work any more than I need to? And some people say I'm lazy. Well, frankly, I think what I really am is efficient. I like to think of myself as efficient. Why spend more than 30 minutes a week weeding if I don't have to? I got other things I can do in life. Okay. Now, raised bed gardens have been around probably well, almost as long as humans have been farmers or agriculture. And there's lots of evidence of that, okay? The, the Romans, the Egyptians, um, the first Europeans to come here, the Native Americans who were here before the Europeans came did raised bed gardening. Of a form, but they didn't do build wooden boxes, they just heaped up the soil and they added compost material to it, frankly. Dead fish, for example. I read that one Connecticut farmer back in the late 1700s used over 200,000 dead fish one season that he had captured to add to the soil to amend the soil in his gardens. So, um, so there's a drawing from medieval Europe of a farmer doing raised bed gardening. I don't know how well focused this is, if you can see it, but this is Lake Side. This is actually taken present day from around Mexico City. When the Spaniards first discovered Mexico City, it was much larger than any European city, over 300,000 people. How did they feed them? They used red bed, raised bed gardening and composting water hyacinths. That's what they did. So, in there is okay, the Inca on the mountains down in Chile, right? They raised beds along the edge of the mountaintop so that the roots would stay warmer because that's one of the advantages to raised beds is that the soil warms up earlier in the season. So you were worried to, with me about frost. I'm less worried about it because I garden in a raised bed and my soil temperature is warmer earlier in the season and later through the season. Okay. Used in Asians, 80% of people in China do gardening sometimes feeding their whole family in less space than most people around here have those lawn tractors kind of, and their other associated garden tools, right? So they do raised bed gardening all throughout Asia. Long time and they've been doing it. Right? So what are some of the advantages? Well, as I said, they warm up faster. That extends your season. I figure I get at least two, two weeks early at the beginning of the season, and I get at least two weeks later for raising the same crops. What has that done? That's added one month right there to my gardening. I actually garden through the winter. I was pulling carrots all winter long. 
I was pulling green onions all winter long. I was harvesting cabbage all through the winter. Anytime it threatened to get frosty, I threw canvas, what's along here, I hadn't learned this, I only learned this term a few weeks ago, tobacco canvas. I call it remake cloth or cover, cover cloth, right, over top. And that protects, that protects down to uh, 25 Fahrenheit, right, from freezing. Come on, come on, there we go. Right? They're also easier on your back. <laughs> right? You don't have to bend over nearly as much, depending upon the height of your garden. The minimum height would be six inches, and you can grow corn in a six inch raised bed. Right? If you can grow corn in a six inch raised bed, you can grow virtually anything. Right? If you want root crops, make your bed a bit deeper so there's place for that root to go, those roots to go. It's e and it's easier to add cover. I've got, a pitch I've got pictures here and I'll show you later of how it's very easy with a raised bed because don't make your raised bed any more than four feet wide. That way you can be on either side of it, reach in two feet, harvest, plant, right, et cetera. And because it's only four feet wide, I use PV white PVC pipe, half inch flexible white PVC pipe, which I attach to the sides of the bed. And then I put that, that cover cloth or plastic in the, to turn a little hoop house or greenhouse early on or later the cover cloth to protect. I also put the cover cloth on to protect from insects. Anything that doesn't need to be pollinated, right? My broccoli, my cabbages, my carrots, my parsnips, my leeks, my onions, if I want to protect them from insect pests, I just put that cover cloth over top and then I don't have to spray any chemicals because the insects can't get in there. So there's a there's a photograph of somebody's raised bed gardening at the back here. You can see they've only got about a six inch raised bed, but they're raising tomatoes and they're letting the tomatoes climb up some kind of um, support. And here is this remake cloth or tobacco canvas over top of, I'm not sure what's under there. That wasn't mine, but so that, and again, the shade cloth will extend your season. Come on, there we go. There's a picture actually of one of my beds with the plastic PVC pipe. I attach it with a bracket, a pipe bracket on either side so I can just pull it out if I want the hoop if I want to and then I just put it over and I weight it down or I clip the remake cloth over. You can build them yourself, easily enough to do. You can buy them already, all the pieces cut and you just assemble from greenhouse, nurse, local nurseries Mize Garden, Evergreen Garden, et cetera, from the big box stores like Lowe's, et cetera, right? They can be built from long-lasting treated wood, from cedar, locust wood, recycled boards, brick, stone, you name it. Now, a lot of people say, well, can you really use pressure-treated wood? And the answer is yes. Okay, University of Tennessee, for example, among a number of other institutes, have done studies, and the leaching out is at the garden pH that the pH of your garden soils is virtually nothing. And when it does, it only goes out the first couple of inches. And what's leaching out is inorganic material, and the plants don't take up the inorganic material. What they assimilate is organic forms that are there naturally anyhow. And if you're worried about it at all, you don't have to worry about it with things like your lettuces and your cabbages because it doesn't get taken up. And the only place it might be is on the skin of your root vegetables, so peel them. All right, that's simple. Um, the treated wood will last you about 20 years. All right, don't use those um, landscape boards because they will rot from the inside on you. But um, treated wood, okay. if you can afford it, cedar's great. And the advantage of making them out of the wood is you're able to add removable covers, as I showed you. It's a little harder to do with if it's brick or stone. Another advantage is you can grow a lot more within the space because you plant without worrying about row spacing. In Europe, they call this biointensive gardening. Right? I, when I look at a seed package, I only pay attention to the space between the plants. And then I space my plants within the garden bed with, for that spacing. Right? Another advantage, as I mentioned, hardly any weeding, especially if you use compost. Because if it's properly composted, composted material, weed seeds, et cetera, in that material will be, have been killed by the heat during the composting process. 
Come on. Go. You don't have to dig. You don't have to hoe. You don't have to rototiller. You make your beds four feet wide. You never have to walk on them. All right? That eliminates compact in the soil. Right? Put compost in there. It's nice and loose. It'll stay loose. Where do we got? More so you grow more in less time with less work. You use less water. You don't have to water nearly as much with the raised bed. One, the compost will hold a lot of water for you. Secondly, once you've planted, and if you plant just with the spacing between the plants, as the plants grow, they end up covering the soil, so there's less exposed soil to, for direct evaporation. Come on, come on. There we go. All right, less need for fertilizer. You don't have to fertilize as much. I, I, I do very little fertilizing, very little, okay? They don't like me at the big box store, so I walk past the fertilizer section, okay? All right, you don't, okay, because you never walk on the path. If you don't walk on the path, you don't compact the soil. That means the soil's nice and loose for the roots. They won't be damaged, they grow better, they're better aerated, and that helps those nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the soil because they require oxygen, all right? Compacted soil, doesn't grow things very well. Why? Because the, uh, there's no air spaces for the bacteria and other microbes and soil organisms. If you don't walk on it, you don't compact it. Okay, build a raised bed. That's what you need if you're going to use wood. You need three pieces. If you want to build a four by eight foot bed, you need three pieces of wood, wood eight feet long, two by sixes or two by eights or two by tens or two by twelves, depending how you want to make your bed. Right, you take two of them, that's your side. You take the third one, you cut it in half, that's your ends. Right? And then you need about 24 screws. Use uh, screws that are intended to be used with outdoor wood, so they won't rust on you. Don't use nails. If you nail, what happens in the winter or whenever it rains, the wood swells, and then when there's not so much rain, the wood dries, it swells, it dries. What does that do to the nails? They work their way out. So you're going around constantly trying to bang those nails back in and frustrate it. But if you pre-drill holes for your screws so the wood won't crack in future years, and then you use proper wood screws, you don't have to worry about that. Right? Obviously, you need a saw to cut the one piece of wood in half. And you need a, some, say, two by four or two by six for each of the four corners just to help reinforce. I priced out using Lowe's prices just recently. That bed, those materials would cost you about $45. All right? And then you, a 4 by 8 foot bed, you can fill in terms of with compost, if it's a 2 by 8 with about a cubic yard and a half of compost. I personally get my compost from the city of Kingsport landfill at $20 for a pickup load. Two pickup loads will more than fill one bed for me. So $80, right? I priced again at the local retailers to buy that four by eight bed kit would cost you anywhere, depending on what it's made of, anywhere from $120 to $160 just for the material, not for the, and then they want to charge you more than you should have to pay for the compost, et cetera. About right. how many seasons would one Oh, minutes. well the wood will last you 20 years or more, right? Now when you fill it with compost, the, that compost is material that the plants will uptake. And so you're going to have to add a bit more compost every year, depending upon the, the plants that you're growing. Tomatoes are really heavy feeders. They might cause the compost to actually deplete by up to f as much as four inches in a growing season. Other things, maybe an inch. So you have to top that compost back up on a yearly basis, right? But you're saving money because you're not using nearly as much fertilizer, presumably not herbicides and not pesticides. So. Okay, so that's, as I said, here's what you need. Okay. And I think we've covered all that already. And then in terms, if you want to check for yourself about whether or not pressure treated wood is safe, because one of the things you go on the internet, you always have to be careful what you read there, right? And there's still a whole lot of sites where you'll go where people say don't use pressure treated wood. I prefer to go to good scientific research. My background is a high school biology teacher. 
All right? Well, I'm big on science and research, and the research is clear, in my view. All right? So I said, even at UT, they've done a study, and at the garden soil pH is not an issue. The best article I have found for sort of reading, come on, come on, there we go, is actually, um, there's a gardening magazine, Fine Gardening, and if you go to their website, finegardening.com, and then search for pressure-treated wood or is pressure-treated wood safe, there's an excellent article there by a lady who said right up front, I'm not going to say yes and I'm not going to say no, I'm just going to share with you what I've learned through reading the research, and that research was from a number of universities, um, agricultural departments, uh, Cana uh, Canadian Power Company, where they were checking what about the leaching from pressure-treated power poles, was that going to harm nearby vegetation, etc. And as I read it, bottom line, as I said before, not an issue because one, plants uptake organic forms, not inorganic forms. Two, the leaching, if should it occur, only occurs within the first couple inches from the wood, and not, in, not beyond, et cetera. So. so, then, right, once you've built your box, lay it on top of the ground, and eliminate the weeds below. This is one time when you might want to use some kind of herbicide containing glycophosphate, which is the active ingredient in Roundup, but there are now a lot of other generics because the patent on that is expired, so there are other generics that you can pay less money for that still have that same active ingredient, glycophosphate. Right? Or, if you don't want to use that, lay down some cardboard or lay down a thick layer of newspapers. Because if you lay down a layer of, say, cardboard boxes, a couple of boxes deep, or newspaper, that will provide a barrier that the weeds will not be able to penetrate, frankly, because they're blocked out the sun, et cetera. That material will eventually decompose. It's organic, right? Carbon source. Plants are going to be happy. Your microorganisms and earthworms eventually will be happy. The earthworms, et cetera, will be able to get, work their way through it. Take them a little bit of time, but they'll get through it. And, the, and then after you've laid that layer down, put your compost on top. Fill your bed with compost and plant. If you spray um, glycophosphate, Roundup, or other generics, when can you start growing? Right away. Why? Because the way that works, it actually interferes with the hormonal, with the hormonal activity in the roots. The le you put it on the leaves, within 15 minutes or a little bit more, the plant will absorb, has absorbed that, glycophosphate goes down into the roots, and it interferes with the water absorption by the roots. So the plants will eventually die of lack of water, because they're unable to take up the water. Okay? Will that affect uh, the stuff that you put on top if you lay compost on top? Not at all, because it will basically have its activity level is gone within about 30 minutes. So you could spray that, you could fill your bed with compost, and you can start your gardening. Right. Oh. And then, so fill your bed with your growing medium, and I would say compost, okay? If it's properly composted, right away, you're not, you're not going to have to deal with weeds that growing season. And then afterwards, if, if you do have to worry about weeds, I want to recommend to you the hillbilly weed eater. Okay? Okay? Where, when, around my beds and around my yard where I am worried about weeds and they're weeds such that I can't just dig them up or whatever, I do use glycophosphate. Okay? I have a gallon jug without a hole in it in which I mix up according to the directions. Because those directions are based on good sound research. Some people say, oh well, if, if, two ta if it says two tablespoons per gallon, I'm going to put in four. Pointless. In fact, if you put in too much, sometimes it actually will actually promote the growth of certain things. So follow the directions directly and closely whenever you're using any chemicals. All right. So I mix up my Roundup, keep it in a gallon jar, and then when I couple, every couple of weeks, I go out with my hillbilly weed eater. I put some of the Roundup mixture in here, and then I go around. Remember I said about being efficient and saving your back? All right. So I take this brush, natural bristle, not nylon or polyester bristle, but natural bristle, right? because it will absorb the liquid better than the polyester will. 
and then I just go around and I just paint the leaves of the plants that I want to get rid of. That way I don't worry about my other ornamentals. That way I'm not spraying too much in the ground. I'm not worried about runoff into the water system, etc. Right? So like I say, about half an hour every couple of weeks, I can go around and do that. The weed is not gone instantaneously. It takes a few days for it to start to curl up and wither. And I have thirst, but it does. How much compost? Well, as I said, you fill a bed. Okay. A minimum, you could use a minimum, as little as about two inches of sand compost, and you could put sand. So say you're building a six-inch bed, and you don't have, you can get sand. Any fill sand will do. Doesn't have to be special sand. Don't go buy the special play sand. Cheapest sand you can get a hold of. Fill it up to about within two inches of the top, and then your compost on top. All right? Compost, organic material, et cetera, on the top, sand below. The Spanish have a word for that. It's spelled F-L-O-R-I-D-A. Florida. Right? Okay. I actually haven't been there, but everybody tells me that most of Florida could easily be described as about a one and a half inch layer of soil on top of sand. Gee, and I buy lots of produce that's grown in Florida. Right? Okay. Okay. Now, I will say to you, the deeper your compost, the better. The longer it's going to last, right, the healthier your plants will probably be, etc. But if you can't get a lot of compost, you can get away with that. The best compost material you can get in, these, in, this, in this area, I would say to you, is horse, composted horse manure. Because it's got, the, it's got the, the green stuff in it, the horse manure, and, it, and their bedding in it, the straw and sawdust, etc. Right? And it's a, so, which is a great mixture, because good compost is made with a mixture of green material and brown material. Right? And so horse manure from the horse barn that's been properly composted is excellent. And there's a lot of horse farms around here where they're more than glad to have somebody pull up with a pickup and take away. <laughs> right? If you know somebody like that, you're fortunate. All right, um, risk of weeds with dirt. Okay. If you were to use dirt, what I'm trying to say here, risk of weeds with dirt, if you try just to put dirt in your bed, that dirt's probably going to have a bunch of weed seeds and et cetera in it. Right? Start clean with clean, good compost, and you're, you're not going to have to worry about those weeds. The sand below, that'll slow down the invasion of earthworms, but they'll get there. You might have to wait a growing season or so, but they'll eventually come. And as I said earlier, you're going to have to top up your compost every year because it's feeding the plants. The plants are, and, the, and it's feeding the microorganisms, the earthworms, the sow bugs, the fungi, the mi various microbes in there, the protozoans, et cetera, that are in that. It's feeding them, but they in turn are producing materials and making materials available to your plants. So you've got to replenish that compost for the sake of those microorganisms and the plants. Okay, now you want to build pathways around your bed if you can. Right? And, the, and the very best thing for your pathways, to avoid dirt and mud and wet, et cetera, is to, um, an invasion by weeds, put a pathway about 30 to 36 inches ar th around your bed. 36 inches allows two people to walk side by side or pass by one another. It's also wide enough if you want to take a wheelbarrow in, the, in amongst your beds, et cetera. You lay down again, you would want to get rid of the weeds, and you might, in here you might want to consider laying down landscape cloth, but you don't have to. And then put a material, now a great material that's available here from places like Vulcan materials, building materials, is chat, or um, th three-eighths sand, okay? Let's put down a half inch of sand, and then one inch of chat or flak dust, or th sometimes it's called three-eighths inch dust, or three inch inch screen gravel. Don't use crushed or run because it won't pack. Whereas the chat or screen gravel at three eighths inch, over a year or two, it will pack nice and solid for you. Right? And it's easy to walk across. In fact, you can even take a wheelchair across it if you want to after a couple of years. 
And that costs, uh, from Vulcan materials, that's about $18 a ton. All right, planning. Uh, what I'm trying to show here, and I, it's not important whether or not you can read this too much. So let's take, here's the back of a seed, seed package for cauliflower. And as I suggested earlier, when I look at these, or the planting instructions for, plant, for my vegetables, I look at the planting depth for the seed, which is usually pretty small. You think about it, how deep does Mother Nature distribute seeds? Not very deep, right? Because mostly they're wind-borne or insect-borne, or they simply fall to the ground. That should be a good clue that you don't have to put your seeds particularly deep. Typically about, no more than about, say, twice or a maximum of three times the width of the seed, not the height. So if I take a bean seed that's like this high by this wide, no more than make two times that width of the bean seed, for example, which is about half an inch. So cauliflower seed, no more than about half an inch, right? And it says here, after transplanting, your cauliflower plants should be about 18 inches. Well, because I have this compost of such great rich material and I not having to compete with weeds, et cetera, I actually cheat on that and I'll probably put them maybe 14 inches together. All right, and I'll put my, and if I'm planting from seed, I'll, I'll put them a little bit closer and thin if I need to, but I wouldn't put them much closer. I put them about 14, my seeds about 14 inches apart. I might put two, two seeds together at 14 inches and when they come up, I might thin, thin cut one of them, not pull it, I just cut it or snip it, either with my fingers or scissors or something. Because if I pull it, I'm likely to disturb the roots of the other one I want left there and growing. Right. So here again, uh, this was out of a, this was off the website, I found this, off some website, I found this great vegetable planting guide, but the thing I pay attention to is not the number of seeds or plants on each 10 feet of row, and I don't worry about inches between the rows, I simply worry about spaces between the plants. Right. And they plant. As I said, you can get them much closer together, so-called biointensive. So, they, instead of planting in rows, they give you a bed as squares, say one foot squares, or okay, I sometimes with my beans I think of a square about um, four feet across and say two feet wide. And I plant my beans in that space. For example, well, so bush beans require, back if we went back to that previous one, about four inches between plants. So I plant them, my seeds, bean seeds, four inches apart in all directions, about two inches in from the edge of the bed. What does that mean? That means that in one square foot, come on, say there's a square foot of my raised bed, looking down on it, I plant one, two, So I've got nine bean plants in one square foot. That's pretty crowded, isn't it? Seems pretty crowded, doesn't it? But they do great, let me tell you. And as they grow, guess what? They shade, therefore there's less water evaporation. There's not space for seed, seed, weed seeds to find their own way in as easily, okay? I am, as I said, I have oh, certain less than 200 square feet of vegetable garden. Last year, out of two plots of bush beans, each four feet by about three feet, we are still eating at least once a week green beans out of the freezer and wondering if we're going to get through them all before I start picking this spring. Really. You know? That's, too, that's just my wife and I. But I'm a fairly big guy and I'm a fairly good eater. <laughs> so you can imagine how many beans that I was able to pick out of two spots what was that, four by three, that's 12, right, 24 square feet. That's not very big, and you know, if you think like this, a spot like this, two spots about the, occupied by these, these four chairs, I can keep a, the two of us fed on green beans at least once a week, virtually for a whole year. All right. That's a pretty good return for a package of seed that cost me about $2. <laughs> Okay, tomato plants. <clears throat> tomato plants require a spacing of about 24 inches, two feet. So in a four by eight bed here, what I would do is I'd put my tomato plants in about one foot from the edge because their roots need to go out on all sides, and then two feet, 
Oh, there's a laser pointer. I gotta use this technology. And then about two feet apart, this way and this way. That'll give me eight plants in a four by eight foot bed. That'll produce about 300 pounds of tomatoes. That's not a bad return, right? Even if I bought them at the nursery at about $1.50 a plant. Okay. We are also trying to get through the tomato sauce. <laughs> okay. Oh, and I only had three plants. I wouldn't grow eight plants. That's more than I could use, personally. Yeah. So for most plants, plant them started, let's say, about six inches in from the side of the bed to give them room. And small plants, like my lettuce plants, I put up within two each inches of the bed. Okay. And then space is directed on the seed pack. Corn plants, about 12 inches apart in all, all directions. So in that eight by four bed, I could, you can get 24 corn plants. I would suggest to you that, that for most, most families of up to four people, that's a pretty good crop of corn for a season. All right as well as all that fresh picking right out of the garden in the late fall or early fall, mm -hmm, corn on the cob. Onions, two inches apart in all directions. Peppers, peppers are really interesting. Peppers like to be crowded. Mm -hmm. They're ideal for raised bed gardening. So I put them uh, 18, I actually probably crowd them more 12 to 14 inches apart and they touch. If the research has shown that if pepper plants are growing so they're touching one another, you'll get up to three times the yield than if they were spaced on not touching. Might have to do with pollination, I'm not sure, right? But it's certainly, um, you'll get a great crop of peppers. Um, this is a photograph. In the back here, this is showing, what this is is the heavy wood lattice that's right, used for fencing, etc., is laying, it's simply laying on top of a frame like this. And the reason it's there is this is what some, some people use to support their tomatoes. Instead of tomato cages for those eight tomato plants, what they do is build a frame of two by two. So you can see the frame of two by twos here sitting in, just with the corner post just inside the bed and these side posts just inside the bed. Lay it inside the bed and then plant your tomatoes and then lay, don't nail, don't screw, just lay on top this wood lattice. What will happen, oh, there it is, complete, the wood lattice. There you are in summer, the tomato plants will grow up, they'll make their way through the lattice, right? Once they're there, they're holding the lattice down. The lattice supports the tomato plants like I say, you'll get up to 300 pounds of tomatoes off an A4 bed like that, all right? What's the advantage of that? Well, to pick them, I just have to go in. Initially, the, first, the beginning of the season, I might, have to, I might find some nice little tomatoes in under here, but most of my tomatoes are gonna be above here. They're gonna stay above here, all right? And then every two or three years, I'll rotate the tomato bed. I'll use a different bed, because that's one of the things you wanna do is try and rotate your plant crops because different plants require different nutrients. So if I move my tomatoes and put it in something else there, there will be nutrients that the tomatoes didn't take out that they'll be able to. Yeah. Well, sorry about the focus on fuzzy. If you don't want eight tomato plants but only four in your eight four by bed, then you could build your lattice work and supports that only takes up half, half the bed. Uh, this is intended to show that you can do a raised bed garden just by mounding the s soil or just lay laying down a bed of compost on top of soil. And this is somebody's gar garden um, in the Kingsport area a couple of years ago, just mounding it up. Okay. Any questions so far? Yes, sir. At my house for our tomatoes, we have issues with squirrels and birds that Sometimes while they're still green. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, well, for the birds, you know, once your tomatoes are starting to set, you might try to throw that bird netting over top. Squirrels, I'm sorry, I don't have any clue. Um, I know, I know. That's one, one of the issues you've got to deal with. There are 
deer, raccoons. I, I found a box turtle climbing up the wall towards my tomato plant last summer, but I got them first. And, <laughs> not gonna wear. and, and being from Vancouver Island in, in Western Canada, I had never seen a box turtle before. So one, I got, had a good look at it first before I packed it away, right? But I'm told that they love to just take one bite of, it, of each tomato, right? So I didn't want them doing that, right? And I just picked them up and moved them a couple of hundred feet away, right? Because I read that if you take them too far away, they lose where their home territory is, but if you move them a couple hundred feet, they'll find their home territory, and it'll take them a while at least to get back to your tomato plants, and I keep an eagle eye out, right? Kind of stuff, so, yeah. Any other questions? Come on. <laughs> I haven't been that good. I haven't been that clear. <laughs> huh? It's all a grand plan, a grand plan. I have a friend that did this a few years ago and very successful. Yeah, uh, it's... a mixed garden. Right. It, we, we, this, is, this is the front of my house that I moved into in June 2011. That's what it looked like when I moved in. All the, there was a boxwood that had not been taken care of at the front. It's quite a slope on this front yard. You can see that it was weedy grass. Right? And that's all we have for gardening is our front yard because as you can see behind the house, we have a forest and we love it because we get lots of birds. We get squirrels. So far, they haven't been a problem in my garden. <laughs> so far. All right. And uh, we wanted to keep it, to keep the bird life, to keep the privacy, et cetera. So we decided, well, our gardening is going to be restricted to a front yard. And it's not a particularly big front yard. So that was June. This was last March. This was just over a year ago. All right. We had it. We decided we'll put in a retaining wall, we'll move the steps that were along the side and put them right down from the driveway into the front door. And you can see the great growing quality of that soil, can't you? Doesn't that look like rich, luscious soil called plasticine red clay? <laughs> Which, again, was new to me. <laughs> but I quickly learned that it has its own attributes of sticking to your boots when it's wet, Right. Not letting water drain through, etc. So that, that was in March 2012, All right, just a year ago. That was October 6th. All right. okay. Same front yard. Raised beds. Raised beds here. You can see the ornamentals. My wife is the aesthetic queen. All right. I couldn't have vegetables by the street. I had to have flowers by the street. Okay which are great, so we've got flowers. Here's uh, one of my vegetable beds. This one is uh, 20 feet long by four feet wide, and I can access it along here, and I can access it below the wall. That's one of the reasons I put it there, that retaining wall that we have built in. I just stand up against the retaining wall, and I reach in two feet to plant and harvest, etc. Right. There was October 6th, there was um, that vegetable garden, the part of the vegetables. You can see I had some cabbages that I put in for winter crop. All right. I'd already pulled all the bush beans and stuff out and eggplant out. I'd put in some cabbages. I had basil at the back here. That's a basil plant at the back. All right. okay. As my wife standing beside, I have a, this is a, she's beside a bed that's four by four. And I built a trellis, and these the cucumbers. This was fairly early in the season. I'm just trying to emphasize that you can go vertical too. Okay, anything that will climb: cucumbers, squash, I mean squash, pole beans. Build yourself some kind of trellis. Pumpkin. Pumpkin will absolutely will. Yeah, you know if it's got the. But you've got to make sure that your your support, your trellis or whatever. You can use strings, rope. Okay, this happens to be plastic trellising, no bigger than about your finger diameter because the tender coals will not wrap around if it's too big. But if it's sort of finger size or, or smaller, then you, know, you could use a net, string netting, whatever. They will if they find it, they'll start to climb it. Obviously peas, we all do for peas, but a lot of people grow, let their cucumbers and their squash and their pumpkins and stuff grow on the ground. Why not have them grow vertically? And then in the front, I had pepper plants that would not have been able to be there 
if the cucumber was spreading all over that four foot bed. So again, biointensive. Okay, that's it. <laughs> I expected more questions. <laughs> okay. I do have some pictures up here if you wanted to look with a little more detail of some other raised beds, um, et cetera. So I'm done. Thank you.